All right, well, good morning again, uh, Epic Church. It is so good to be with you. Uh, here at the Regal, we always like to welcome those uh, li- listening or, or watching online this week uh, through our website, our podcast, YouTube. Uh, we are glad that you're with us as well. Uh, before we jump in for the message for today, uh, as you just saw in that video, uh, next Sunday we are starting a new teaching series called Travel Light. Travel Light. And with the holiday season here, uh, hopefully it brings some enjoyable moments for you, but we also know that it brings a lot of extra pressure whether that is uh, relationship pressure or families, financial, just stress levels. And so in this series, we're going to talk about how to uh, let go some of the burdens that God never intended us to carry. And not just for the holiday season, but for our lives as a whole. But we know the holiday season tends to to, uh, highlight that just a little bit more. And so uh, this is also a great time of year, a great series to what we say be a bringer. And so in that program today, uh, in other places out in the lobby, there are some invite cards that you can use uh, to to just invite somebody who's not connected to a church or or maybe far from God. A great series, also a great time of year. In fact, let me say this, next Sunday, we'll let you know what our plans are for Christmas Eve services, so you're in the know on that. Uh, I'm excited about that. So uh, just a fun time of year, a good time of year, and that series, Travel Light, will start next Sunday. Sunday, but today we're going to put the finishing touches on this series called Flipping Tables. And over the past few weeks, we've been looking at uh, four different things that angered Jesus. And we've talked about greedy gain and shallow love. Last Sunday, we talked about religious hypocrisy, these things that just frustrated and angered Jesus. And as we've said, that his anger was not sinful, it was not misdirected, it was not destructive like ours often is, but there were some things that angered Jesus. Jesus. And what we're talking about today is a hard heart. A hard heart. Another word for that, some translations use the phrase a stubborn heart. How many of you are stubborn sometimes, by the way? Don't lie in church. Come on, see you. Okay. Uh, How many of you know someone who is even more stubborn than you? All right. I won't ask if you're sitting next to them or anything like that today. But yeah, this is something we all... We all see it in ourselves, we see it in other people, so some of you know this, Uh, I have two dogs at home, we have two dogs at home, there they are right there. Um, The one on the left, his name is Sully, he's about a year and a half, one of the best dogs uh, like we've ever had, just a great dog, he's always ready to have fun, listens to everything you say, doesn't want to let you down, (laughs) all those, just an amazing dog. But the one on the right, I know some of you, she's a great dog too. We, we, we love her. Her name is Sadie. She really is a sweet dog. But let me just say this. She's a little stubborn sometimes. Like she moves at her own pace. She'll listen, but on her own terms. You know what I mean by that? Like, Mark, I'll do what you say, but it's going to take me a little while to do it. Just like, it reminds you of that phrase, stubborn as a mule, which by the way, did you know that mules actually are not stubborn? that they're actually very smart. They have a tendency towards self-preservation. They will not let their owners overwork them, so they'll just, they've gotten this reputation, stubborn as a mule. Okay, Mark, what in the world are you talking about? Like, What does this have to do with anything? Well, as we'll see, I think, pretty clearly today, one of the things that angered Jesus is what he called a a, a stubborn heart, hardness of heart. In fact, where, where, where I want to go first to see this is in a, an interaction that Jesus had in the, in the Gospel of Mark, so Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John in the New Testament. In, in, in chapter 3, Jesus is interacting with some religious leaders, there's other people there, and, and last Sunday we said that the, the hypocrisy of these religious leaders angered Jesus, but as we'll see today, their hard hearts did the same thing. And so in Mark chapter 3, we see this story, and it says this, that another time, Jesus went into the movie theater, and a man with a, some of you are awake, not movie theater, but into the synagogue, and a man with a shriveled hand or a deformed hand was there. And some of them, meaning the religious leaders and the Pharisees, some of them were looking for a reason to accuse Jesus. So they watched him closely to see if he would heal him on the Sabbath. Let me stop there for a moment just for some context. The Sabbath 
was a day that God gave to his people a command to take a break from all work, a day to rest, a day to refocus on God, a day to be refreshed spiritually. And Jesus taught this, though, that the purpose of the Sabbath was the fact that you and I need it. We need some time to stop. We need some time to refocus. We need some time to be refreshed, uh, even on God. But what the Pharisees did and the religious leaders, they turned it into a list, like just a bunch of things that you could not do. And the list got really long. And they would accuse people. They would go after people who, who were doing something that couldn't be done on the Sabbath. So even though Jesus wants to bring healing to this man, they don't care. It's the Sabbath and you can't do any work. Totally missing the heart of it. So we see this in verse 3. That Jesus said to the man with the shriveled hand, stand up in front of everyone. And Jesus asked them, so speaking out to the religious leaders, which is lawful on the Sabbath? Like what's the purpose, to do good or to do evil? To save life or to kill? But what happens? They, they remain silent. So again, it didn't matter that Jesus is about to do something miraculous. They, they're, they're stuck. They're stuck with a hard heart on just being legalistic. And then verse 5, here's our key verse. It says, he looked around at them in, say it with me, in anger, and deeply distressed at their stubborn hearts, said to the man, stretch out your hand. And he stretched it out, and his hand was completely restored. And then the Pharisees, they went out. They began to plot with the Herodians. This was a political party who were loyal to King Herod, and they, they, they opposed Jesus. And the Pharisees go over to them, and they try to figure out how they might kill Jesus. So Jesus heals this man, but they don't care. Why? Because of a, or he, he heals this man, that, but the stubborn heart, a hard heart. You know, that, that phrase, hardness of heart, it's used often in Scripture, and the literal meaning of hardness of heart, the, the image is, is a covering with a callus. And I know that's a beautiful image for a Sunday morning. We're not going to put an image up on the screen or anything like that. You get it. But, but what is a callus? Well, it, it's, a, it's thickened skin that actually forms over time because of increased irritation or pressure, or friction. And so Jesus is saying to these religious leaders, to these Pharisees, you've got a callus formed over your heart. And here was the problem with it. That, that calloused heart, that stubborn heart, that hardness of heart, it kept them from knowing who Jesus was and what he came to do. And that's really the problem of a hard heart. In fact, let me say this. Do you know what a hard heart, a stubborn heart really is as we begin to think about our lives? You know what it is? It's unbelief. Unbelief, when for whatever reason, and it's really easy for it to form, kind of a callus forms over our heart. And we either can't see or we don't want to see what God would want to do in our lives. I'll show you another example of when this phrase, hardness of heart, is used. In, uh, in, in the book of Hebrews, the writer of Hebrews, he's actually writing uh, to people about the fact that, that Jesus came as Savior for all people. And he's also writing back to a time in history when the Israelites have been freed from bondage in Egypt and, and God has led them out and they're, they're going towards the promised land, but they began to rebel against God. They began to complain uh, to God and all of these different things, a hard heart. And, and because of that, they, started, they got the treat of wandering through the wilderness for a while and didn't see the promised land. And so this writer in Hebrews is, is writing to people because he doesn't want them to do the same thing and miss out on Jesus just like these people missed out on the promised land. And he says this, in, in Hebrews 3, verses 7 and 8. So as the Holy Spirit says today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as you did in the rebellion during the time of testing in the wilderness. Epic Church, I can tell you all week, all week, this has been my prayer for us, that today, if we hear his voice, that we wouldn't harden our hearts. I know for some of us today, like hearing his voice, our, our next step, our first step is to say yes to faith in him. And today, if you hear his voice, to not harden your hearts. For others, we've made that decision, but there's a challenge we're facing. There's something that we're facing, and, and God just wants to help us through that. But let's not harden our hearts, amen? Like, let's be open to what he wants to do because uh, here's what Hebrews 3.19 says. Again, continuing w w the dialogue. So we see they were not able to enter. They weren't able to enter the promised land, but this also signifies salvation through Jesus. These people were not able to enter because of their what? Their unbelief. Their unbelief. Now, it'd be easy for us today to pile on to the religious leaders and the Pharisees and the Israelites and just call them out for their hardness of hearts. But that really wouldn't help us very much. Instead, 
uh, let's just think about ourselves. How is it with our hearts? I know I can have a stubborn, hard, unbelieving heart at times. So how is it with our hearts? As many of you know, we are uh, in the middle of uh, starting to, to do some renovations to the former Sears Auto Center over at the Eastern Hills Mall and that'll uh, be used for our facility for our next season as a church. And a lot of the demo and some cleanup, all that stuff has, has been happening. And uh, we thought, uh, thankfully we don't have to, but we thought that like in the bathroom area, there were some huge, <laughs> huge and a lot like concrete brick walls that had to come down. And like we were really not looking forward to that because it, it's hard work and it creates a mess and all of this stuff, it's just, it's just not a glorious job, okay? There's a lot of other things you'd rather, rather be doing. And if we hired it out, it would have been a costly thing. So we're not really looking for it. Thankfully, we don't have to do that. But I bring all that up today because as I was even in there this week thinking about those walls, it, it kind of hit me, and, and I feel like God brought to my mind some of the prayer requests that many of you share on the back of those connection cards. As I and our team, we read through those and pray through those, that a lot of us in this theater today are facing something that feels like those brick, not not brick, but those concrete walls that are (laughs) so hot. How am I getting, can't get over it? How am I going to get through it? How are these things going to come down? So many of us are facing something that feels like that. Whether it's because you lost a job and there's financial pressure, or there's something in our family creating conflict and we feel that pressure there. It may be anxiety over our future or something in school. It's just a busy semester or, or with a group of friends at school and there's, there's some chaos there. Or, or maybe it's a pain or hurt from something that somebody said to us or that somebody did to us. The list goes on and on, whether it's just worry about the future or the pressures that we face or worried about our kids' future, worry about our own, whatever it is. Like we, we know what it feels like to have a struggle, to have a trial, to have difficulty that feels like just a huge wall in front of us. God, how am I going to get over this? How am I going to get through this? And I bring all that up to say this today, that as you think about what that trial is or that difficulty or, or, or what that is for you today, we have a choice in how we will respond. Either with a hard, stubborn, calloused, unbelieving heart or, or with great faith. So let me say this. Did you know that, did you know that we can actually we can actually amaze Jesus with our response. Like scripture shows a few different examples that we can amaze Jesus. Like that amazes me. I just said amaze like 50 different times in 30 seconds. But think about that. Like you can can amaze Jesus. And one of the things we'll see is that even in the midst of that difficulty or that trial, whatever has you up at night, that anxiety that perhaps you're facing today, that when we respond and we we remember, no, 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 God, God is my provider. That he is, like, he is with me. He goes before me. He is my strength. He, he, he is everything I need. That when we respond that way, it actually amazes Jesus. But the opposite is true too. That one of the things we'll see, and I'll show you the example, is that Jesus was actually amazed by lack of faith. Jesus was amazed by a lack of faith. I'll show you the example when this happens. So Jesus is, is in the season of his life where he's ministering to people. He returns to his hometown, and he wants to minister to the people there. But because it was his hometown, people were like, hold on, I know Jesus. I know, I know his family. It's just a carpenter. They're like, he's no big deal. He grew up around here. Like, <laughs> why is everybody making such a big deal about him? I know his parents. I, I know all of that. And, and we see this in Luke chapter, I'm sorry, Mark chapter 6. Verse 4 says, Jesus said to them, a prophet is not without honor except where? Except in his own town, among his relatives, in his own home. And he could not do any miracles there except lay hands on a few sick people and heal them, which seems like a lot to me, but he evidently wanted to do more. And look at verse 6. He was amazed at their lack of faith. Could you just picture that? Picture Jesus looking on just, man, they've seen me do so much. And they still don't believe. They think back to times when I've been faithful. Why do they have a hard heart? Why are they stuck in unbelief, amazed at their lack of faith? Now, before you beat yourself up too bad about a lack of faith, and I won't do it to myself either, it's a natural response for us. So it's easy for us with that trial, with that struggle, whatever's in your way today, it's easier for us to, to just kind of naturally drift and, well, God, well, maybe he can't do anything about this. 
Or why does that person have it so easy? Why am I always dealing with something? God, what can you possibly do about this? I know you helped that person. I know you could do this, but, but this, this situation is different. He was amazed by lack of faith. I know none of us want that, so let me give you the better option. Jesus was also amazed by great faith. He was amazed by great faith. Let me give you the story. There's a Roman centurion. A centurion was just an officer in the Roman army, but he had a, a servant who was just near and dear to him. The servant got sick and desperately wanted to see his servant healed, and so he seeks after Jesus. Jesus is around. Jesus is about to go to his home, but this Roman centurion is like, no, you don't even need to come to my house. I don't deserve it. I, I, I'm not worthy of that. And he says this to Jesus. He says, just say the word, and my servant will be healed. And here's how Jesus responded to that. When he heard this, he was what? He was amazed at him. And turning to the crowd following him, he said, I tell you, I have not found such great faith even in Israel. Think about that today, Epic Church, with the challenge you're facing. We have a choice. And the question for today is, how will we respond? With great faith or with a lack of faith? I received an email this week from uh, somebody in our church, a man in our church, and uh, the email uh, just simply said this. He said, Pastor Mark, I lost my job yesterday. Please keep me and my family in your prayers. Okay, how many of you know that's a big issue? Like that's a concrete wall. That's a, that's a, that's a large wall that's got to come down somehow. Like you got to scale it or you got to get through it, something. Like that, that's a real issue. But I loved his simple response. He just said this, God is bigger than this and I know he has a plan. Can, can I tell you just in those simple words, that amazes Jesus. In, in the same way that that Roman centurion would say, no, 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 just say the word and my servant will be healed. I just believe this, that when we respond in that way, when we respond in that way, it, it's just something that, that honors Jesus. So what I'd love for you to, to think about today, because I want to give you a few thoughts. I'm not going to give you a th any thoughts on how to have a lack of faith, okay? None of us want to go there. We, we want great faith. And please know this, just having great faith does not mean, okay, I'm going to have faith. I'll just kind of go home, sit on the couch, and let God work it out. No, it, there's some action to it. There's some choices to it. So I'd love for you to keep in mind, have, have at the front of your mind that, that challenge, that trial, that difficulty, the pressure you're feeling, wherever the anxiety is coming from, whatever's keeping you up at night, okay, keep that thing in mind and let's talk about how to overcome unbelief with great faith. Three choices. The first thing is this. I've got to choose to believe when I don't see. I've got to choose to believe. Notice it's a choice. I'm going to choose to believe even when I don't know the outcome. When I don't know when the season of disappointment is going to end, when I don't know when it's, how it's going to play out or how it fits in to the five-year plan, when I don't see, I'm going to choose to believe. So my wife, Rebecca, and I, we had a, a parent fail this week. I feel like I've had a lot of parent fails recently. But my daughter, uh, she was at soccer practice, and she needed to be picked up at 7 o'clock p.m. Some of you know where this is going. And Rebecca had a little miscommunication about who was actually picking her up. And so Rebecca comes in. I'm at home, and she comes into the house. It's like 7.15. She's like, you didn't pick up Kaya? I was like, no, because you were picking up Kaya, all right? <laughs> and so she runs out, goes to get her, and she got there about 7.25 or so, and, and Kaya comes in the house, and I'm like, honey, I'm so sorry. We, like, forgot about you and all that. I hope you'll, uh, I hope you'll forgive us. <laughs> and now, here was the good thing. You could tell just in the way that she reacted that, like she, she didn't really have the thought ever of, well, maybe my parents just don't care enough to pick me up. Or maybe they've disappeared from the face of the earth. Now, don't get me wrong. Like there was some anxiety in those 25 minutes. But, but there was still a, a confidence, a belief that like, my parents didn't just like, leave me here and say, have fun for the rest of your li life in this like, soccer place. There was, like, there was some confidence there. Now, here's what I know. That when we can't see the outcome of something it becomes difficult to, to, to have great faith. And so for some of us, just, you know, to be very specific, it's, it's I don't know how this financial thing is going to work out. I don't know how this job thing is going to work out. Am I in the right major? I don't know how this relationship is, is going to work out. Like, I, I don't see the outcome. Some of us have been praying and praying and praying. And it feels like God is silent. It's like you're waiting for him to pick you up from soccer practice or something like that. And you prayed and you prayed and you prayed. I can tell you this. It's in those moments that we have a choice. That even when I don't know the outcome, 
I'm going to choose to believe. Just this past week, just in my own just kind of quiet time of reading Scripture and prayer, I was reading in, in Hebrews chapter 11, which is often called the faith chapter because it gives so many great examples of people who had great faith despite uncertain circumstances. And by the way, you don't need faith in certain circumstances. You, you need faith, you, you, need, you need great faith when things are uncertain. And in this chapter, Hebrews 11, so many examples of people were, it was uncertain, but God was, was using that to test like their obedience. And, and we see this in the, uh, Hebrews 11, verse 1. It gives this great definition. Some of you have heard this before, but here it is. What's faith? It is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. Assurance about what we do not see. See, it takes faith to say yes to faith in Jesus for the first place because we can't see him with our eyes. It takes faith to believe that he's with you in the trial that you're facing. That word assurance there, you know what it means? It means, it means conviction. And it also means evidence. In other words, even though I can't see him, like there's some evidence that he is with me. There, there are other things, by the way, you can, like you can't see wind, but you can see its evidence. You can't see gravity, but I guarantee you, if you jump off a tall ladder, there will be some evidence of gravity. Faith is the assurance, conviction, confidence, even when we don't see. Choose to believe, amen? The second thing is this, I'm going to choose to obey when I don't understand. I'm going to choose to obey when I don't understand. Here is the principle for this one. The outcome is God's responsibility. Obedience is ours. So with whatever you're facing today, the outcome is God's response, but, but obedience is ours. And as I just mentioned, Scripture just full of examples of people who had uncertain circumstances, but God used that as a test of their obedience. One example is Sarah from the Old Testament, Abraham and Sarah, and God had promised a child and to be the father and mother of nations, but it just wasn't happening, and Sarah's getting older and older and older, and it's like, what's the deal, God? Like, it's going to be difficult at this point. But we see this in Hebrews 11, verse 11, that by faith, even Sarah, who was past childbearing age, was, was enabled to bear children. Why? Because she considered him faithful who made the promise. And I love that, I love that phrase, and I think it's so key when we're facing something that feels like that concrete wall. She considered him faithful. In other words, because she knew the source, she remembered the source, like she, she was okay to obey even when she didn't understand. And here's how, like if, if, if somebody asks you to do something that you don't trust, that, that you don't even know, like it's, there's probably a small likelihood that we're going to actually do. For example, if you get an email that says, hey, congratulations, you won $100,000. You just got to leave us your social security number and a $5,000 deposit. Now, if you don't know the right response to that, let me just help you today because I love you, okay? Don't trust that, all right? It is too good to be true. But if you think about your life when there's someone who you do trust, who you know has your best interest at heart, when they ask you to do something or they speak something into you and maybe you're really not even sure, like it's different when the source is trustworthy. And that's what, what Sarah does here. She, she considered him faithful. Like, it doesn't make sense to me. I don't understand. I don't know the outcome. I just know this, that my God is faithful. And so because of that, I'm going to choose to obey. Even when it doesn't make sense. The outcome is God's responsibility. Obedience is ours. Here's what I know. I know a lot of us are in a season in which there are a lot of I don't knows. I don't know how this is going to work out. I don't know how this is going to play out. I don't know how this fits into the 10-year plan. I don't know. I don't know. I, can I encourage you today, Epic Church? Don't let the I don't know I don't know is keep you from what you do know. Don't let the I don't I should say it this way. Don't let, don't let those I don't knows keep them from who you do know. That he is faithful. So choose to obey. Choose to believe. And the third thought is this. I'm going to choose to persevere when it's difficult. Choose to persevere when it's difficult. I think a lot of people have a misunderstanding about faith. I think sometimes we think that, okay, Mark, I get it. We're in church. You're saying have faith. Okay, not a shocker. But a lot of people have this misunderstanding that it means I just, well, okay, the outcome is God's responsibility. That's what Pastor Mark said. And so I'm going to have faith. So now I just go home and just, I'll just kind of sit there and let God do his thing. 
Many of you already know this. Some of you are in a season like that. I, I've experienced this too. No, ha- having great faith means that like, you're going to run through some walls sometimes. And when you don't feel like getting back up, great faith gets you back up. And you're going to persevere through whatever that thing is. That's what great faith is. It's not just faith in faith itself. It's not just faith in things that, that they'll get better just on their own. No, I, I'm, I'm going to trust in God, but at the same time, I know that, that, that he's going to use me in, in whatever wise thing I need to do, whatever decision I need to make, and I'm going to persevere when it gets difficult. So Hebrews chapter 11 gives all, all these examples of great faith. And then at the start of chapter 12, the next chapter, it says this, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, meaning all of the examples of faith I just looked at in chapter 11, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. And let us run with, say it with me, perseverance. The race marked out for us. How do we do that? Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. So, Epic Church, let me ask you, how will we respond? With stubborn, hard, calloused, unbelieving heart, or with great faith? Let me just share a personal example with you. So, I think it was Tuesday of this week, Tuesday, Wednesday, and wrapped up just all these words that I just got done sharing with you today. For whatever reason, um, you know, you have those moments when, whether it's stress or pressure or responsibility, sometimes they just hit you, don't they? And I'm in my kitchen on Tuesday or Wednesday of this week, and just like some of the, some of the pressures just, just, just hit me. And, and, you know, whether it had to do with this, this building that we're renovating and raising resources for it, other things that we have happening and other things coming up. I'm just in my kitchen, like, and I'm, and I'm feeling it. I know many of you have been there. And it's funny because God kind of brought to my mind, well, what about those words you just wrote that you plan on sharing on Sunday? I was like, yeah, but that's, a, you know, because we always justify our own stuff, don't we? Yeah, but God, this is different. And I, I'm, I have this moment in the kitchen and just honestly, to be real with you, just kind of struggling. Just under the weight of, of some of those things that just feel like heavy burdens at, at times. And in our kitchen, we have like a little Amazon Alexa thing. You know, it's like Siri on your phone. And you can ask her fun things like, are mules really stubborn? Or you know, things like that, and she'll tell you. But it was just playing music or whatever. And all of a sudden, uh, the song Do It Again came on. And I'm in my kitchen. God, I've seen you move mountains before. I believe you'll do it again. And just in a, just in, the only way I can say it is just to say in just a holy, sacred space. Just to have the, just to have the time to just worship God right there in my kitchen. And he brought me these three thoughts back to mind. You're going to choose to, you're going to choose to believe when you don't see. You're going to choose to obey when you don't understand. And you're going to persevere. Even when it gets difficult. And I can tell you that in that moment, in that moment of, of worship, there's a great exchange that takes place. Okay, our worry for his peace. And you've got to fight through it sometimes to get there. I only share that with you today because I want to give you that same opportunity today. That with that trial, with that struggle, with that difficulty, whatever you're facing, to give you the opportunity to give that over to him with great faith. To not keep it yourself. Don't let a callous form in your heart. Don't get stuck in unbelief. We've got them, but you're here. And you'll have a moment today to do just that. Hebrews 11 verse 6 says this, Without faith, it's impossible to please God. Because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those earnestly seek him. So lack of faith or great faith? That's our choice today. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you for today. We thank you for your word. God, I pray just over this room today, specifically, God, for those who feel like they've got a wall in front of them with a trial, a struggle, some difficulty, some pressure, and they don't know how they're going to get through. I think of, of 
of those struggling financially today, God. I think of those in school struggling with just the weight of a semester. I think of parents in this room today. I think of those who are in a season of transition. God, whatever it might be, this can be a holy, sacred moment. God, we declare today that you've been faithful. And we believe today, God, that you'll do it again. And we give you the appraise in advance. We consider you faithful. And we get our eyes on you and off of ourselves. So God, may you be honored in this moment. Let this place just be filled with faith today. In Jesus' name, and everybody who agreed said,